Good evening, everyone. How are we all doing this evening? Wonderful. Whoa, I like that. Good stuff. So you made it through the rain. That's good. Pat yourselves on the back. Now we know Messianic Jews don't melt. That's good news. But uh, yes, we're very happy to see you here on this Friday evening. Uh, we want to welcome you. Um, this is Mishkan David, which is Hebrew for Tabernacle of David. And we are here gathered to celebrate in the first feast ever instituted by the king of the universe, Shabbat. And if you've never heard that word before, it just means rest. And uh, it's a wonderful evening. We're, we're always happy to get here every single week because of the reason why we are here. But the reason that the Lord gave us the name Mishkan David is because of what it says in Amos chapter 9 and verse 11. It says that the tabernacle of David would be raised up again in these last days. And I'm sure we can all agree that uh, we are getting much, much closer to the end than we have previously. If you're looking at the events in the world right now and you know your Bible even a little bit, the things are starting to line up. So we're very thankful to the Lord for raising this place up because of what happens in the places like this and every other place like it. It uh, Three reasons. The first, it says that their breach would be closed. What breach are we talking about? Well, if you look around the room, we have Jewish people and non-Jewish people coming together in agreement. That in itself is a miraculous event because we have been divided for well over 2,000 years. Unfortunately, the Jewish people, they made the mistake and didn't recognize our Messiah, which had said that would happen. And then secondly, after his death, they uh, went away from the script. The followers of the Lord at that time, they started to do their own ideas, their own traditions, and they went away from the Word of God, and it created the modern church today, which looks very different than the original design and those first century disciples of the followers of our Messiah, Yeshua. And we call him Yeshua because that is his Hebrew name. That is the name his mama gave him. No one called him Jesus till several centuries later until the English language was, was invented. So we love to use his original name, Yeshua. And we are gathered together as Jewish people and non-Jewish people in his name. And that is why amazing things happen here. Not because any of us, but because of him. Because what his word says in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20, when two or three are gathered in his name, his promise would be that he will be here in the midst of us. And the second thing it says would be the rebuilding of the temple. Now there is physical evidence and scriptural evidence to back that up. There is a place in Israel called the Temple Institute. They have everything ready per the exact specifications of the word of God for the rebuilding of the temple. They just can't do anything yet because the site is currently occupied and yes the physical restoration of Israel is going to happen that is the promise from God to the people of Israel but what happens with Israel is a physical representation of what is happening with us in the spirit their journey is our journey just like right now there are tens of thousands of Jews who have realized in Israel that Yeshua is their Messiah and the messianic movement is starting to explode over there at an exponential rate the events that are going on in Israel that are happening right now the overall culture of the country is leaving uh, uh, the, the atheism, the agnosticism behind, and they're going back to who they were meant to be, which was the people of God. So that is something amazing that is happening, and that is why Rav Shaul Paul wrote that they are our examples that we don't lust after the same things that they lusted because they were given to us so that we could show and be given the way to point to our Messiah, Yeshua. And so we know that that physical restoration of the temple is happening, but also the spiritual restoration of the temple is happening because if you have a relationship with the Lord, if you have accepted him into your heart, the Holy Spirit is now living in you and with you. And a restoration of your life is meant to be happening if you are doing Bible things in a Bible way. And the last reason it says would be the restoration of the ways of the temple. Now, what was the temple used for? It's a couple things. First, to house the Holy Spirit and the Holy of Holies. The Lord placed himself there so that he could be in the midst of his people. Secondly, for sacrifice. Thirdly, for worship. And fourth, for service. And the way that we know that all of those things are being brought back to us is because of the life of 
of our Messiah, Yeshua. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And he asked us to follow him. He said, you are my disciples. He didn't say converts. He didn't say believers. In fact, he himself said, being a believer is not even good enough because even the devils believe that God exists. So the point of him coming and giving and living here and then ultimately laying down his life so that we would become followers of him. That is the whole point of being a disciple. That is the whole point of entering into a relationship with God is to follow after Messiah Yeshua because he was perfect. And that is the principle that the Lord gave to uh, the establishment of this place many, many moons ago, and we stick to him. We don't deviate from Messiah Yeshua. We don't deviate from the way he lived his life, the way that he spoke, the way that he thought, everything that he did is what we want to do because you can't get better than perfection. So if you like all of that stuff, I would ask that you please stand and join me. Behind me is the Shabbat table, the candles, the bread, and the wine. All these elements go into the inauguration of the Shabbat. And again, like I said, the absolute 100% goal of Mishkan David is to point us straight to our Messiah Yeshua. So everything we do is all about him. Now, if you come from a Jewish background before, you're going to be familiar with this blessing over the candles because our people have been doing it for a very, very long time. Fortunately for us and the places like us who have the gift of the Holy Spirit, you can look at the Torah, you can read the first covenant, and you can actually get the revelation that everything does point to our Messiah Yeshua. And there's a lot of rabbinical opinions as to why we light the candles. We know the Lord loves candles. The candles had to be continuously lit 24 hours a day, seven days a week within the temple. We just finished the Feast of Lights, Hanukkah. If you didn't get a chance to celebrate that with us, we encourage you to go look at our archives. We had an amazing message from Rabbi Gabe last week as to the point of the Feast of Dedication and how our Messiah Yeshua spoke on that day. But this blessing specifically for us, we look at what it says in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. One of the prophecies before he was born, well over 700 years before he was born, it says, the Lord himself would give us a sign that a virgin would conceive and give birth to a son and his name would be Im Anu El. That is Hebrew to English. It is Emmanuel or God is with us. And uh, our dear Rebbitson lights the candles for us because it is a physical show and tell that the light of the world did indeed come through a woman, thus being a fulfillment of prophecy from our God to us. ברוך אתה אדוני אלוהינו מלך העולם אשר קידשנו בדברו ונתן לנו את ישוע משיקנו וציווינו לאיות אור העולם אמן Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe. You have sanctified us by your word, given us Yeshua, our Messiah, and commanded us to be a light to the world. Bendito eres tu, Señor, nuestro Dios, Rey del Universo. Tú nos has santificado con tu palabra, nos has dado Yeshua, nuestro Mesías, y nos has mandado a ser una luz para el mundo. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Reverend. The light of the world did indeed come through a woman. Now, the next prayer you're going to see is the blessing over the bread. And uh, we like to present this challah every single week because of a wonderful revelation that our dear Rabbi Gabe got uh, not so many moons ago. Um, the traditional recipe of the challah is three pieces of dough being braided into one loaf. And as our dear Rabbi Gabe was watching the Rebetzin construct one of these in the kitchen one day, the Lord told him in his heart that this 
is a representation of who he is. Now, the word of God says, let one prophesy and the rest judge. So when we hear someone say, thus saith the Lord, you have to do something called test the spirit. A lot of us, we like to just take in what people have to say without consulting the Lord for ourselves, but we're not called to do that. So how do we know Rabbi Gabe heard from the Lord that night? Well, if you know the Word of God, you know that the Lord presents himself in a plural fashion several, several times throughout the Word of God. The first time it happens is in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 where he said, Let us make man in our image and our likeness. Now, if you want to read into that a little bit, you would see that if God really wanted to present himself in a singular fashion, he would have said, I will make man in my image and my likeness. But he chose his words very specifically in Hebrew, anachnu, us, our, that same thing. Later on, my favorite reference is in Isaiah chapter 40, where he says, I will send my spirit upon him. That is another the reference of three of the Lord putting his Holy Spirit upon our Messiah Yeshua, which we saw come to pass when he was baptized by Yohanan Hamad Bil, and it says the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. And then, of course, the most famous reference that everyone knows can be found in 1 John chapter 5. It says, there are three that bear record in heaven. That's just King James fancy English for the ones who call the shots. And it says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so we know that the Lord is one because of what the Hebrew word is. It's echad, but what it actually translates to is a compound unity, a complex unity. So there's a lot of Trinitarian doctrines out there that say it's three separate beings, but we don't believe that because the Word of God says that He is three within one. And even if our finite minds cannot fully grasp, that is how he has decided to present himself to us. And so the first step to having a relationship with someone is accepting that that's who they say they are. Now, Rodolfo, he told me my name is Rodolfo, but if I said, no, I'm going to call you Roddy, then we wouldn't be able to be good friends because he asked me to call him Rodolfo. So that is the premise of having a relationship. You first must accept how the other person is presenting themselves to you. And that is how the Lord decided to present himself to us. So we obviously want to accept the way that he says who he says he is. But most importantly, what this uh, prayer is about is what it says in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2. It gives us the exact pin point GPS location of where our Messiah would be born. It says, but thou Bethlehem Ephrata, though you be little among the thousands of Judah, out of thee will he come forth who is to be king from old and to everlasting. And we know that this prophecy is specifically talking about our Messiah Yeshua. A lot of the rabbis in the rabbinical community will say, no, they're talking about King David. Well, it's impossible to write a prophecy about someone who has already passed. By the time Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 was written, David was in the sepulchre of his fathers, like it says in the word of God. And there is only one king that I know of who has been prophesied from old and who has been prophesied to be king forever. And that is our Messiah, Yeshua. And so we know that that is what that prophecy is telling us about. But also, too, on what was the first night of Pesach, Passover, what the church calls the Last Supper, which I like to clarify every week. Technically, it was the first supper because it was the first night of the Feast of Passover, which also started the Feast of Unleavened Bread. He said, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when our Messiah tells us to do something, we definitely want to listen. Right, And so every single week as a family, we come together in what everyone calls the communion. Yes, we do communion every single week because of what it means, what it stands for. And our Messiah said when we do it, we want to remember his sacrifice. He said, this is my body broken for you. And so he left us with something very beautiful. He took the punishment on our behalf for two reasons. Number one, so we don't punish ourselves because the devil has another nickname. He is called the accuser of the brethren. And the word of God says he does it day 
and night. So that means 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the devil wants you to beat yourself up. He wants you to live in guilt. He wants you to live in shame because he doesn't have to lie. We all sin. All he's going to do is remind us of the sins that we've committed so that we shy away and we remove ourselves from the presence of God. But our Messiah Yeshua gave us his body as our sacrifice so that we don't have to feel any guilt or any shame. And we don't abuse grace like Rav Shaul said. He said, if God, if God has given us grace, do we continue to sin? God forbid. We don't use grace as a get-out-of-jail-free card. We use grace to propel us forward in our relationship with God. It is not meant so that we could run around and do whatever we want. We were given grace so that we never have to be out of his presence ever again. And so we thank him for taking our punishment, and we remind ourselves that he took the punishment for everybody else. Because we all harm each other as well. We're imperfect people. We don't have the perfect love of God, even though if you start plugging into him, you will start acting in perfect love once you're in his presence. But we all make mistakes and we harm one another. And it is in those moments that we have to remember, even if you don't like the person, sometimes people aren't very likable. He died for them too. And that is a way to keep ourselves humble, thanking him that he took the punishment for us and he also took the punishment for everybody else. So please join me as we do this in remembrance of him as he asked us to do. We're going to sing it together first in Hebrew and then speak it in English. <clears throat> Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who wishes forth bread from the earth. Amen. And let us never forget that Yeshua, our Messiah, is the true bread from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and never taste death. Please partake in his body. And the next prayer on the screen is the blessing over the wine. Very, very important as well because of what the wine represents. If you've read your Bible even a little bit, you know oftentimes the Lord uses wine as uh, blood. And um, also, too, on that same night after he passed around the matzah to his Talmudim, his disciples, he then lifted the cup and he said, This is the blood of my new covenant drink. And why did he say that? Not because he was coming up with a new idea, but because he was confirming the covenant that was promised to us from the Lord. We encourage everyone to read Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 34 a billion times, a billion times, because a lot of people like to argue, well, the new covenant was written later on. We don't know exactly where it stems from. Blase, blase, incorrect. The new covenant was first presented to us in the first covenant. Oh my goodness, you mean the new is the old revealed and the old is the new concealed? Absolutely, it's one fluid document from beginning all the way to the end. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He doesn't change and he's always desired the same thing. He abhors religion. Religion is when you put God in a box and you try to define him in your own way so that everyone can, you know, make money in Jesus' name or whatever reason you have for doing it. God has always desired a relationship. The first time that the gospel was presented to mankind was in Belashit in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned. First thing they did was go head in a bushel and they made man-made clothing and covered themselves because they realized they were naked and they were ashamed of their sin and they were ashamed of their nakedness. And the Lord addressed both things immediately. He didn't fry them in their sneakers like he could have because he knew exactly what they did, when they did it, whom they did it with, why they did it. But what he did was he went out into the garden, he called to them, by name, and he encouraged them to reveal themselves to him. Thank God Adam and Eve were smart enough to do that. And of course, Adam blamed Eve, and then Eve blamed the devil, and then the devil just did what the devil does. And uh, the Lord eliminated the blame game on that day as well, because each of us as individuals have to take responsibility for the choices we make. So you cannot say, he made me do it. You cannot say, she made me do it. You cannot say, the devil made me do it. All you can do is one of two things, live in denial 
or take accountability for your actions. It's the only two choices that would lead you back into the arms of the Lord. But what he did after they took responsibility was he addressed their physical shame by slaying an animal and covering them with animal skins, but it was also a spiritual symbol because sin requires sacrifice. It requires a price to be paid because he is a holy and perfect God and he cannot be in the presence of sin and he never wants us out of his presence. So he gave us another way to remain by his side forever and ever, ultimately with the perfect sacrifice with our Messiah Yeshua so that past, present, and future sins, we could take advantage of what was written in Hebrews chapter 12, which says, we may boldly approach the throne of grace in our time of need. So we want to thank him for that because we have found the pearl of value at Mishkan David, which is to continuously be in the presence of our Father. So please join me as we sing it first in Hebrew and then together in English. <laughs> Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. As King David said, come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Please, taste and see. If he's good, say amen. All right. Now, everything here, the Shabbat table, the candles, the bread, and the wine, this is a prophetic and Hebraic version of the presentation of the gospel. Why do we do it this way? Because... Sometimes out there, the gospel is presented in a few different ways that aren't biblically accurate, but the gospel is supposed to be an invitation for you to start your relationship with God through Messiah Yeshua, because he said, no man comes unto the Father but by me. And the reason why we do it at the beginning of our Shabbat service, unlike many congregations out there who do an altar call at the end of the service, hoping that you are touched in some way during the service, but we like to do it at the beginning of our service, because it is Shabbat, and the Bible says that he gives his loved ones sleep. And also it says that there is no rest for the wicked. And we don't say that to beat anybody over the head with the Bible. We say that because all of us here have experienced what life without God is. You have no peace. I was raised in a Jewish household, so I physically rested. I'm used to the concept of Shabbat, of physically resting, not doing work. But internally, even if you're sitting there doing nothing, your mind can still be going a million miles an hour. And that is called no peace. But God, the God we serve, he leaves you complete. Nothing missing, nothing broken. He doesn't just want you to physically rest. He also wants you to have rest internally. And the only way you can have true rest internally, some people drink, some people smoke weed. I used to do that stuff too. Some people pursue parties and, you know, whatever it is. But true internal peace comes from having the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit of God, living in you and with you. And that is the point of Shabbat. We rest today, one day a week for 24 hours so that we can learn to live in His rest every single day of the week. And when you start doing that, we have a Mishkan David coin term. It's called Shabbat mode. That is when you're walking in rest, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the way you do that after salvation is by doing what Messiah Yeshua said. They came to him in Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 through 40, saying, Master, Rabbi, what is the greatest commandment in the law? Which the direct transliteration from Hebrew to Greek got a little lost there. And actually, it's most important. What is the most important thing in the whole Bible? And he quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4, 4 and 5, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall worship the one Lord, you shall love him, pardon me, with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength, meaning every aspect of who you are is supposed to love him. Now, some people would say, that's impossible. Well, it's not impossible. We've all been obsessed with many different things in our life. We were created with addictive personalities. There's nothing wrong with being an addict. 
We just get addicted to the wrong thing. The Lord designed us to be addicts, and we're meant to be addicts of him. We're meant to be God addicts. We're meant to be in love with him. We're meant to be enamored by him because the word of God says he will romance us because he is our groom and we are the bride. And that is the type of relationship that he seeks to have because he himself said there is no love greater a man has for a friend than this than to lay down his life for his friends. And so all he's asking us is to do the same thing he did for us already. That's why the word of God says we can love him because he loved us first. And of course it says to pick up your cross and follow him on a daily basis. And so he is only asking us to do what he has already done because it can be done. A lot of people say it can't be done. It's impossible to love God with everything. Well, then you're going to have to talk to the many people in here who have done it. You're going to have to talk to all the heroes of the Bible who have done it, and they will prove you wrong because we are witnesses that it works. You just love him first, and then he will bless you in every single aspect of your life. And the way we do that is by reciting the Shema together as a family every week, reminding us that Yeshua Jesus himself said, this is the most important thing. If you're not doing this, nothing else you can do will make God happy. Because he said, I want you to do this first. Doesn't matter how much you tithe. Doesn't matter how much works you do. He said, if you don't have love, you're a clanging gong. That's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which gives us the biblical definition of love. So you must love first, and then he will build upon everything else, like he said in his covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, where he will write his law on our hearts and in our inward parts. But we must present him our inward parts for him to be able to write. So please join me as we say this first in Hebrew and then in English. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad Bauch Shem Kevot Malchuto Leolam Vaed Hero Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed is his name, whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Amen. Please give him a round of applause if you like that. Now, these next two prayers are very, very important. You only will really like them if you're doing the Shema. Because when I first started attending, I was like, oh, my God, this is so many prayers. My ankles are hurting. Why are we standing for so long? Don't worry. I understand. But then when you love the Lord, it says you start to delight yourself in the Shabbat. And everything that involves the Shabbat and everything that involves him, you start to fall in love with it. And participating in these prayers becomes a blessing. And this Kiddush prayer is thanking him for who he is, honoring him that he is the creator of the universe, and reminding us what the Shabbat is about. Because he has given us this day, he said, as a sign between him and us forever. And so we definitely are thankful for everything that he's done and is doing in our lives, and we're going to say it together first in Hebrew and then in English. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam, asher kidishanu b'mitzvotav ratzavanu, v'shabbat kodesho b'hav ratzon hing hilanu, zikron l'maseh v'reshit, ki hi yom tehila l'mekre kodesh, zikhiya l'tziat mitzrayim, ki vano v'harta v'otanu kidishta mekol ha'amim, v'shabbat kodeshecha b'hav ratzon hing haltanu. Baruch atah Adonai mekadesh ha'shabbat. Amen. And we said, Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with his commandments and wanted us to be his own. And with love and favor, he gave us his holy Sabbath as a heritage, a remembrance of creation. For that day is the prologue to the holy convocation, a memorial of the exodus from Egypt. For us did you choose and us did you sanctify from all the nations. And your holy Sabbath with love and favor did you give us as a heritage. Blessed are you, O Lord, who sanctified is the Sabbath. Amen. This last and final prayer is the refuah, the prayer for healing. And the Hebraic lens of praying and asking the Lord for healing is a little bit different than what we see employed today. First and foremost, we obviously, as this plaque says, believe in miracles. The difference between us and other places, perhaps, is that we don't command God to do anything. 
We got a lot of people walking around saying, I command this, I claim this, I walk around this building seven times and it'll be mine. And then they're casting out sicknesses and all of these things. Sometimes on TV it works. Sometimes. But the greatest place to be is in a humility of position with our Lord and God in heaven. And so we don't command him here. He commands us. The only power it says that he has given us is over the, over the devil and his angels. But we allow him to do what he wants to do. And that is a Hebraic lens when you're asking the Lord for mercy is you're placing yourself at the foot of his throne. We have seen many miracles here. We've seen thousands upon thousands of healings. I myself have been a restorer to physical ailments that the doctor said would be impossible, but that is because I just allowed myself to be in the presence of my father, and he did what he wanted to do in my life. And so I am a witness that this prayer works, and uh, we have several people here that are witnesses that God still is in the he healing and miracle business. Yes, we have some brothers and sisters that have graduated that he's given the ultimate healing and still taken home. He has the answers for that too. But the most important thing that we have to keep in mind is that he works in the matters of the heart. The Word of God says that if you have malice or you have anything within your heart, that the heavens would be like brass. Your prayers won't even reach up there. And so every single week before we recite this prayer, we like to remind us of ourselves that we must walk in mercy. Because our Messiah Yeshua said, if you do not forgive your brother his trespasses, when that time comes, I will not forgive you yours. And we definitely don't want to take that chance. And so we must walk in mercy and love regardless of what anyone else is doing. It doesn't matter what anyone else is doing. It only matters what you do. So with that spirit in mind, please let us recite this prayer, thanking and acknowledging that the Lord is the healer and the king of the universe. And we know that if we do what he says, he will do what he promises, first in Hebrew and then in English. Rafael Donai ven Rafael Hoshienu ven Ivashiach heal us O Lord and we shall be healed save us and we shall be saved Katilatenu ata for you are our praise vehe ale refua shlema lechol machutenu and bring complete healing for our ailments Ihiratzon mel fanecha Donai Elohei velohei avotenu may it be your will O Lord our God and God of our forefathers Shetishlach mehe refua shlema min hashemaim that you quickly send a complete recovery from heaven. Spiritual healing and physical healing. For you are God, King, the faithful and compassionate healer. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, who heals the sick of his people, Israel. Amen. Now, our dear brother Adolfo is going to come and uh, blow the shofar for us. It is a call to worship. And then our Rebbitson is going to take us through our time of worship because what the Word of God says is that we enter into his courts with thanksgiving and with praise. And so we love you all. We're very happy to see you here. And Shabbat Shalom. ויהי ערב ויהי בוקר יום השישי. ויכולו השמיים והארץ וכל צפעם. ויכל אלוהים ביום השביעי מילתו אשר עשה. וישבות ביום השביעי מכל מילתו אשר עשה. ויברך אלוהים מיום השביעי ויקדש אותו. כי בו שבת מכל מילתו אשר ברא אלוהים לעשות. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who separates the holy from the profane, 
Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who instituted and grants us a Shabbat of rest, a day of rest, a day of rest for our souls, our hearts, and our minds, a day of resting in fellowship with you. As you rest from your works, you call us to rest from ours, resting in your presence and fellowship with you and in fellowship with one another. And this is a privilege. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, keeper of promises, the promise that you made at the beginning of time in Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, when our first father, Adam, failed and violated the covenant that he had with you and plunged all of us to be condemned to be conceived in sin. And yet, O oh Lord our God, even then, you demonstrated your mercy, even at that moment, and you promised that you would send a deliverer, a savior, to save humanity from its sin, to save us from our sins, to redeem us, and to save us from ourselves. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because you did exactly that, and you sent Messiah Yeshua. The Devar Hashem, the Word of God, made flesh and dwelt among us to teach us how to walk in righteousness, to teach us by his own example, by his own life, to demonstrate what it truly means to walk in your presence and to walk with you and to walk in obedience and in fellowship with you so that we could learn to do it as well. And that's why he came. He manifested. The word of God was manifested as the greatest rabbi that ever lived because we understand that a rabbi's job is to teach us how to live. And Messiah came to teach us how to live, not just to live, but to live eternally, eternally and to have an abundant life. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because Messiah Yeshua taught us that true righteousness begins in the heart first and helped, helped us to understand that a true disciple of the Messiah, a true disciple, a true follower of you, O oh Lord our God, is known by two qualities, faith and obedience. And that if you clean the inside of the cup first, the outside would be cleansed as well, which means that if we address the spiritual issues of our heart first, that then your light would shine through us and we would indeed become a light to the world as Messiah Yeshua mandated each and every one of us. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, because Messiah Yeshua will return again very soon. As the angels told the disciples, when they saw Messiah ascend to heaven, they said, this same Yeshua which you saw ascend will descend again. And he will set his feet on the Mount of Olives. He will take his rightful place on the throne of David in Jerusalem as king and high priest. And he will establish, O Lord our God, your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And at long last, bring about true peace on earth and goodwill to all men. As we enter into your courts with thanksgiving and with praise, Lord, we begin with the words of the prophet Isaiah. You spoke through the prophet Isaiah, and you said, if thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable, and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words, then shall you delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Amen and amen. As we enter into your courts, O Lord, with thanksgiving and with praise, because it is Shabbat. Thank the Lord.
six days of the week, anticipate and see the first of his feast. It is Shabbat, it is Shabbat, thank the Lord, it is Shabbat, thank the Lord, it is Shabbat. Our Messiah made a wonderful promise recorded in the book of Yohanan in the book of John. And he said, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it sees him not, neither knows him, because, but you know him, for he dwells with you and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Thank you, my Messiah Yeshua, for this wonderful promise, this promise that you've kept, because you keep your promises to us. And the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, dwells in each and every one of us who have received you now. But not just to dwell and sit there, but to guide us into all truth and show us things to come and to be our comforter. And so it is through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can hear your voice, O Lord our God. And tonight we stand before you on this Shabbat as one family, asking you, O Lord our God, speak to us, speak to our heart, speak to our mind, speak to our soul. We're ready to hear and obey. Yeshua in the eye of 
The psalmist wrote, Remember not the sins of my youth, O Lord, nor my transgressions. According to thy mercy, remember thou me for thy goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore will he teach sinners in the way. The meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way.
the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God And the Lord our God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob made a promise through the prophet Isaiah, a promise that he kept and will keep again. And he said, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. We praise you and we thank you, Lord. Abraham saw this day and he rejoiced. And we see that day approaching and we rejoice as well. Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. with all 
turn to someone now and uh, wish somebody a Shabbat Shalom, greet your neighbor and share a smile, a kind word, a word of encouragement. And uh, as we get ready to hear a message uh, from Rabbi Gabe, um, a Shabbat message for each and every one of us.
It is good to praise the Lord. Thank you, honey. Beautiful. Thank you, dancers. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Anyone happy to be in the house of the Lord besides me? Thank you for coming out in this windy and wet weather. You guys don't melt in the rain. That's a good sign. You're not just fair weather believers. And is the Lord here with us? Is he here? Can you feel the presence of the Lord here? Can you feel the peace? The Lord said in Matthew 18 and 20, where two or three are gathered in his name, in my name, he said, he said, there am I in the midst of them. And so we are gathered. Can we say his name in Hebrew? Yeshua. And because we're gathered in his name, he's here because he said he would be here. One thing God cannot do is lie. And so I've said this many times before, if you don't have a close encounter with the Lord, it's not because he's not here, it's because you're not here. And I've said this many times, you can be physically present somewhere and your mind could be a million miles away and then you'll miss out. Because the scripture says in Isaiah 26 and verse 3 that he would keep us in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him. And so if we could just put our minds on God and our hearts on God, we'll have that peace that surpasses all understanding. We'll have what King David said in his presence is fullness of joy at his right hand, our pleasures. And that's, that's the psalm we're going to read tonight. We're in a place called Mishkan David, the tabernacle of David. So we're going to read a psalm from King David as we usually do. And then we'll pray. And then we'll talk about the only true and living God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so we're going to read Psalm 16, which talks about as his right hand, our pleasures, or there are pleasures. So let's read Psalm 16. And it starts out, Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. O my soul, thou hast said unto the Lord, Thou art my Lord. My goodness extendeth not to thee, but to the saints that are in the earth, and to the excellent in whom is all my delight. Their sorrow shall be multiplied, that hasten after an other God. Their drink offerings of blood will I not offer, nor take up their names into my lips." The Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my lot. The lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage. I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. My reigns also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. My flesh also shall rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in hell, neither will you suffer your Holy One to see corruption. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Amen. What a, what a, what a beautiful psalm. There's not one bad psalm in all 150. They're all beautiful. And one thing you do get from the psalms of King David, you see a man who is after God's own heart, a worshiper of God. And you see a man who is thirsty and, and hungry for God. How many people are hungry for God? 
Blessed are those that hunger and thirst, it says, for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you here tonight. We call upon you in the name above every name, the name Yeshua HaMashiach. And Father, we are not here just to seek your hand. We are here to seek your face, that your face would shine upon each and every one of us, that you would fill us with your light, that you would invade every bit of darkness in each and every one of us, every bit of oppression, every bit of depression in the name of Yeshua, Lord and that, and that you would fill us with your truth, your words, and that you would set all the captives free according to your word. And Father God, we rejoice in our salvation tonight and our Savior, our Messiah, our names written in heaven, your spirit, Father in heaven, bearing witness with our spirit that we are your sons and we're your daughters. And as we rejoice tonight, our hearts go out to family members, relatives, brothers, sisters, family members, friends, neighbors, co-workers. Father, you know each and every one of them. We pray for them constantly. Draw them to yourself as you have done for each and every one of us. Let them taste and see that you are good. Our heart, Father in heaven, is that none perish. Use us mightily as light and salt for everyone that we come in contact with, Lord, that we may draw them to yourself, Lord, in the name of Yeshua, let their names be written in heaven. As we look around this room, Father in heaven, there are brothers and sisters who are not here that you have called to be here for whatever reason. Touch them wherever they are. Heal them. Restore them. Set the captives free. Open doors if they had to work to keep your holy day, your Shabbat. If they're sick, heal them, Lord. Let them come to your house. Let them brag about you, Lord, what you have done in their lives among the family of God here. In the name of Yeshua, we thank you, Father, you've given us power over all the power of the enemy to tread on them, on scorpions and serpents. Nothing by any means hurt us. We take this authority tonight. We command every unclean spirit. We break every assignment of the enemy against us individually, against our families, against the Mishkan. In the name of Yeshua, we command every unclean spirit away. From this place, we command every unclean spirit for those watching on the internet in the name of Yeshua. And Father God, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We pray for Israel. We pray for all the fallen soldiers. We pray for, for the peace in, in the Middle East, Lord, that you would intervene, that you would use this calamity, this war, this horror to draw people to yourself, everyone to yourself, Lord, that they may become not warmongers, but peacemakers. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us to be peacemakers and not troublemakers in the name of Yeshua. And we thank you, Father, in heaven for every single thing that has happened in our lives to this very moment, knowing as your word declares that all things do work together for the good because we love you and because you have called us for your purpose. We thank you, Father, in heaven for this amazing purpose for each and every one of us that you have called us to be conformed into the image of your Son, our Messiah, our Savior, our King, our Lord, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. In his name we pray tonight, the name Yeshua, HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen. That's a good amen. Thank you, Carlene. <laughs> but anyway, um, today, tonight, fi we finish... What we started celebrating last week, which is the Feast of Hanukkah. How many people celebrated for eight days? I saw lots of you posting on Facebook, lighting a candle every day and, and, and praying and recognizing uh, this feast. And as Messianic believers, we like to focus not just on the miracle of the oil, which is what most of Judaism focuses on. We like to focus on the word Hanukkah, which in Hebrew means dedication, and we like to focus on dedication because until you're dedicated to the Lord God of Israel, you'll miss out on all kinds of amazing blessings and revelations until you are totally dedicated. And of course, the Lord gave an amazing message on this feast. It's found in the book of John in chapter 10. And... Uh, I mean, he said, I think it's worth saying it, you know, talking about it again. 
Um, it reminds me of my Spanish class, that how do you learn something? Repitan. Remember your Spanish class, your Spanish teacher? The funny thing is, I was in Spanish class, and I'm from Argentina, and, and the Spanish teacher who was, I think she was Spanish also, and she wanted me to, re, to memorize these stupid repetitions, and I was fluent in Spanish. I said, I'm not going to do that. It's a waste of time. And she got upset with me. I'm like, yeah, we can have a conversation in Spanish anytime you want. You know, it's like she gave me a C in her class. <laughs> but I refuse, you know, voy a la biblioteca and all these stupid things, you know. It's like, I don't want to go to the biblioteca, okay? <laughs> Just leave me alone. You know, I'm fluent in Spanish. But I mean, some people are just stubborn, you know, just can't convince them of anything. They just, they, they, you know, they go by the rules and they will not bend any of the rules. If you want, I said, I'll teach the class for you. <laughs> but anyway, verse 22 in the book of John, chapter 10, talks about it was at Jerusalem, the feast of. It says the dedication, which means Hanukkah. It was the Feast of Hanukkah. It was winter. That's one that usually happens. And Yeshua, notice, he walked in verse 23 in the temple, in Solomon's porch, meaning also in Solomon's temple. This was the temple that was, shall we say, rededicated to the worship of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, how, many know that, how many know that the temple of God had been desecrated by the enemy? by the adversaries, and uh, had erected uh, from, from historical uh, information, they had erected a, a deity in the temple, the, a, a, the god of Zeus. They, had, they were sacrificing pigs on the altar, which of course is all against the god of Israel. And, uh, and this, this group called the Maccabees got upset, and they decided to revolt. And they decided to conquer back the temple in Jerusalem, and they um, and they were successful, and they, and the temple was rededicated to the true worship of God, kind of like what we go through, because the Bible says, as New Testament believers, it says that our physical bodies are now the temple of the Holy Spirit, and at some point in our life, we were under the influence of the enemy. We had probably erected idols. We had probably been idolaters. We had probably eaten pork, many of us, and desecrated the temple of God. There's still brothers and sisters that, that don't want to go on the divine menu, which I call Leviticus chapter 11. God wants us to eat clean foods because the word kosher means clean. Our Father in heaven wants us to eat the best food, not the worst food. And so don't take it as legalism. Take it as love, that God wants you to eat the best Live the best, feel the best, and so it's not punishment. You know, if you miss bacon, get turkey bacon, you know. But whatever, I mean, the Lord put on my heart not, not to no longer eat these things. I'm from Argentina. A lot of Italians, they eat pork constantly. Salami, calamari, all the things, all, you know, all the fruta di mari, all the, all, all the lobster, shrimp, all, all, all the scavengers of the ocean. And God says in Leviticus chapter 11, I want you to eat uh, fish with fins and scales. When you eat fish with fins and scales, you're eating the cleanest animals of the ocean. When you eat God's animals, you're eating the best animals. And so I'm just, I'm just throwing that out to you, not because I'm pressuring you. I'm just saying that all of God's laws are for our benefit, not for our uh, punishment. Uh, this is God's love, that we keep his commandments, the Bible says. And his commandments are not grievous. I'm living some of my best life now as a Torah-observant Messianic Jew. In other words, I'm not walking in this new way, violating the old way. Because he did no such thing. If we're going to follow him, you've got to copy him the way he was. He did not break the old covenant to keep the new covenant, by the way. I mean, that took me a while to understand. In other words, the old covenant was a type and shadow of things to come. When you walk in this amazing new way, the old covenant is child's play. It's nothing. It's a piece of cake. It's elementary school. When you walk in this amazing new covenant, now you're in graduate school. You're in university level. 
You're in the spirit. You're walking in the spirit. You're not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. You're living your best life under this new covenant if you walk it out this way. And the Bible says that he will write his laws in our hearts and in our minds. And this is where this feast comes in because the Lord is talking about being dedicated. When you're dedicated to God and you love God, you're going to do what he says. Because Yeshua said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John chapter 5, this is God's love, that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not grievous. How do I experience God's love? When I don't do what he says or when I do do what he says? I mean, think about that. How ridiculous for people to think that if I don't do what God says, it's going to be good. No, it's not going to be any good. Most of human suffering is because we don't do what God says. And our dedication to God is minimal at best. Most people have minimal dedication to God. Just recognizing once in a while, you know, thank you for my meal. You know, how about dub thank you for the grub, you know, stuff like that. I mean, ridiculous. But the Lord came to show this amazing way, this amazing truth, and this amazing life, and it's available to every human being because, because God so loved every human being. God loved the world. In other words, this now is available not just for Jewish people. It's available for everyone. And so what an amazing deal that God has put on the table, and most people reject it. You know, it's like he said, my wedding's prepared, the feast is prepared, and I've invited, no one's showing up. So what do he tell his disciples? The party's off. The feast is off. He said, go get everybody. Go to the highways, go to the byways, and whoever will show up, they can come to the feast. And that's pretty much what the new covenant. Everybody come. Feast here with God. Have this amazing life that God is offering. Yeshua said in John 10, I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly, but without some kind of level of dedication or rededication to God, there's not the results. The Bible says you reap what you sow. If you sow sparingly, then you will reap sparingly. In other words, Yeshua complains to one of the churches in Asia. He says, I would rather you were hot or cold. You're lukewarm. In other words, kum si kum sa. You're neither hot, you're, not, you're, you're, you're lukewarm. He said, I would rather you were hot or cold. Because God can, heal with, God can deal with hot or cold. He can't deal with lukewarm. So what does he say? I'll spew you out of my mouth. And so that's why he begins his sermon in Matthew 5. Blessed are those that hunger and thirst. Hungry for it. They want it. You know, God rewards those that diligently seek him. And, and, and it's up to us. I mean, you could be lukewarm. You could be blasé. You could not take this serious. But you're not going to get the same results. And I don't care what you do in this life. If you're blasé about it, if you don't put some effort into it, you'll never be good at it. And you'll never reap the rewards of, of somebody who really put some effort into it. And, uh, and it's the same thing in the kingdom of God. You will end up with what you put in with how much effort you put in. That's how God is. How you measure, it shall be measured back to you. And, and then it says God is not mocked. In other words, you can fool people, yea or nay. I'm not saying people are easily fooled, but we are fooled. But you cannot fool God. He knows who is and who isn't. He knows who's doing it and who's not doing it. And it's like, I mean, it's, it's pretty sad. So the Jewish people come around, you know, his own people, my people, verse 24, and said to him, how long do you make us to doubt? Now I'm thinking, why does it say the Jews came around? Because the Jews were under the Roman occupation. So it wasn't the Romans that came around. It was the Jews. It was his own people. They come around. And they said to him, how long do you make us to doubt? If you be the Messiah, if you are the Messiah, if you are the Christ, that's what the, the word Christ means, Mashiach, means anointed, same word. And they tell him, tell us plainly, make it obvious. Amen. Could he have made it any more obvious than he was making it, that he was the Messiah? 
I mean, could, it was obvious. I mean, I'll never forget, when I accepted Yeshua in my life and I read the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I was like, a fifth grader, a third grader, an elementary school could see that Yeshua is the Messiah promised to Israel. I mean, who else could it be? And then you still have people denying this. I mean, it's, I mean, are we sick or what? And so tell us plainly, and Yeshua tells him and he answers him, I told you, and you believe not. I told you, you don't believe. I mean, how many times can you tell somebody and they still don't believe you? I mean, is that human nature? Because people say, he never said he was the Messiah. He just said, I told you. And you didn't believe it. Okay, I tell you, you don't believe it. Uh, how about that the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. In other words, I told you, you don't believe. How about if, if, if you, how about if, if you believe the works that I do in my Father's name? They bear witness of me that I am the Messiah. Yay or nay? Is, is he talking like that? You don't believe what I'm saying? Okay, believe what you're seeing. They didn't believe what he said. They didn't believe what they saw. As a matter of fact, how crazy are people? When he was healing, he said, you're doing this by the works of the devil. I mean, that's how crazy people are. Oh, yeah, the devil heals. The devil casts himself out. The lame walk, the blind see. Yeah, the devil did that. How I many know oh, the devil's never going to do that? He has other signs and wonders, you know. But the devil only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He says, a house divided is not going to stand. The devil's not going to cast himself out. The devil's not going to heal anybody. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to mess you up. So at least believe. Believe me for the works that I do in my Father's name. They bear witness of me. Now he's saying all this in what feast? Dedication. He said, but you believe not because, verse, what's your problem? Why are you why are you not a believer? Because you are not of my sheep, as I said to you. Verse 27, my sheep hear. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. You mean God knows me? Personally? He, did he just say that? I mean, is that amazing? How many know the devil's a liar that people think God doesn't care about you? My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they do what? They follow. Now, let me ask you a question. How can you follow God, A, if you're not a sheep, and B, if you don't hear his voice? Can you really follow somebody you don't hear? Can you really follow somebody you don't know? I mean, are you deceived yourself? In other words, how do we follow the invisible God? I mean, because people say, oh, I'm led of the Spirit. No, you're not. You're led of the flesh. Because I see the stuff you do. God didn't tell you to do these things. You're doing this on your own. In other words, there's a way to follow God, and there's a way not to follow God. And if you don't follow God properly, you're not his sheep, and you don't hear him. And when you don't hear him, you're blind. And what happens to the blind? What did Yeshua say? The blind shall lead the blind, and they both end up great. The blind shall lead the blind, and we're going to do wonderful. We're going to be blessed. We're going to go from glory to glory. No, you're going to fall into a ditch, both of you. How's that for prophecy over your life? My sheep hear my voice. I know them. They follow. How do we follow? We hear them. How do you hear them? We follow. How do you hear them? We're sheep. How do you hear them? Oh, good question. Good question. Not only do we follow him, not only do we hear his voice, Notice what, notice what the reward is of following him. I give to them temporary life. I give them a nice ride. 
I give him a thrill. No, what does he give? What does he give you when you follow him, when you're a sheep, when you hear his voice? What does he give you? I give him eternal life. And notice what he says. They shall never perish. Is that a guarantee? Once saved, always saved? How about if you don't follow him? How about if you don't hear his voice? How about if you do whatever you want? Could you end up in trouble? And notice what it says. Neither shall any man pluck them. How many know we're always subject to being plucked? What does plucked mean? It means that you'll be taken away from God. Something or someone will take you away. And how many know the adversary is in the takeaway business? He only comes to steal, kill, and destroy. What is he trying to steal? What is he trying to kill? What is he trying to destroy? Your relationship with God. Because this is not, I mean, this is a walk. This is a relationship. And all these instructions are coming out of his mouth when? On the feast of rededication. I mean, is this amazing? When I, when I realized this, I was like, wow. He's really talking about what a, a person who's dedicated to the Lord, the results, the benefits, eternal life. No one can pluck you out of his hand. How many know that that's a fear of many people? I've heard many people say, I think I lost my salvation. Did somebody pluck you out of his hand? He just said no one could pluck you out of his hand. No man. Maybe you plucked yourself. Maybe the Lord convinced oh, the Lord. Maybe the devil convinced you. That I've heard people say, I think I lost my salvation. No, you didn't. If you walk with him and you follow him and you hear his voice and you constantly acknowledge him in all of your ways, he will direct your path. It says, lean not upon your own understanding. How do I get led by God? You don't lean upon your own understanding. You acknowledge him in all of your ways. He will direct. Amen? And he will lead. Are you with me? How do we know he's willing to lead? King David, he knew this concept. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. When you say the Lord is my shepherd, what does that mean? You're a sheep. Good way to start prayer. The Lord is my shepherd. Bah. I'm a sheep. He's my shepherd. He leads. I follow. Where is he leading you? To green pastures. To still waters. What's he doing for you? He's restoring my soul. And surely goodness and mercy is following me all the days of my life. I mean, I love, he's an awesome shepherd. Why is he an awesome shepherd? Because he laid his life down for his sheep. Greater love has no man than this, that a man laid down his life for his friends. You are my friends, John 15, if you do whatsoever I command you. You are my friends if you do what I tell you. Oh, I love God. Do you do anything God says? No, I am my own person. I do whatever I feel like. Oh, so you lead, you're, you're led by your emotions? If it feels good, you do it. If it doesn't feel good, you don't do it. How's it going for you? Uh, it's not going too well. I seem to be making bad decisions in my life. I don't know why. I zigged when I should have zagged. I zagged when I should have zigged. I just seem to come up with all these bad ideas and bad decisions. Have you been there, Rabbi Gabe? Yes. And what did you do? I labored to enter into his rest. I cease from my own works as God did from his. I stopped making my own decisions. I began to acknowledge him in all of my ways. Uh-huh. Did you do this before? Never. You started? Yes. I tried it. 
and I like it. Because you can't like what you don't try. If you're still doing your own thing in Jesus' name, I'm here to tell you, you will be doing your own thing in Jesus' name. He'll be following you, and you'll be leading. And he'll be going, when are you going to learn? How many times are you going to fall into a ditch? How many times are you going to cry? How many times are you going to despair? How many times are you going to complain? How many times are you going to blame me for your troubles? Come on now, how many people have you blamed God and you did your own thing? God, why did you do this? I didn't do anything. You did it. I've been waiting for you to, so I can tell you what to do. Does that make sense? You know what the beautiful thing about a relationship with God? He lets you still have a free will. In other words, you don't have to do what God says anytime. You can do what God says all the time. You can do what God says some of the time, most of the time, or none of the time. Every day is like that. Every day is a new day. Yea or nay? Weeping endures for a night. Joy comes in the morning. You made a bunch of bad decisions yesterday. Tomorrow's a new day. Maybe you'll start out the day different. You'll acknowledge him. You'll start out your day acknowledging God. You'll listen for God. What a concept. You'll stop telling him what to do. You'll start asking him, what should I do? Your prayer life should change. Are you with me? When you acknowledge someone who's going to lead you and who's going to talk into your spirit and is going to lead you by his spirit, then your prayer life needs to change accordingly. In other words, you're going to wait on him. You're going to listen for him. You, when you pray, you're going to listen more than talk. Talk less. Are you with me? Because I remember when I first started, I was like, blah, 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 blah. In Jesus' name. And then when God tried to speak to me, I was gone. I gave him my, my uh, uh, to-do list or what I wanted list. And it was it. In Jesus' name. This is what I want. This is how I want it. This is when I want it. This is where I want it and how I want it. Thank you, Lord, that you hear my prayers in Jesus' name. How did it work for you? Not too well. As a matter of fact, looking back now, I am glad he wasn't listening. I am glad he didn't give me what I wanted. I'm glad I finally ended up doing what he wanted, to do his will here on earth as it is in heaven. You think people in heaven are doing their own will? You think people in heaven are disconnected from God? You think anything in heaven is disconnected from God? How many know anything that's disconnected from God dies, perishes? Yea or nay? So now the Lord comes into this world as a human being to talk to human beings I told you I'm the Messiah. I told you I'm the promised one. We don't believe you. Okay, you don't believe me? At least believe me for the things that I'm doing because I don't see too many of you doing those things. Are you with me? How many know he did some amazing things? Supernatural. In other words, if you, if you walk the way he did, you will walk in the supernatural. You will exhibit the supernatural. You will demonstrate the supernatural because you're going to run around telling people you're anointed. And of course, they're going to believe you. I'm anointed. Oh, yes. You know, hail to the chief. You're anointed? Oh, my God. Why don't you tell me this sooner? Or they'll tell you, like, what does that mean? You're anointed. Well, God has anointed me. To do what? To tell you what to do. And how to do it. I mean, you see how crazy it is? He comes into the world. He comes to his own. His own rejects him. His own receives him not. He demonstrates amazing things, supernatural things. The dead raised to life. The blind seeing. The lame walking. The lepers cleansed. Demons cast out, and they're like, no, we don't believe you. Can't be. 
I mean, what planet are we living on? What kind of brains are we walking around with? I mean, what kind of denial are we in? I mean, it's amazing the denial. I see this all the time in people. It is amazing. So let's go back here. I give to them, verse 28, eternal life. They shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. I mean, tremendous promises. My Father which gave them me is greater than everything or all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's. In other words, when we do what he says, we have divine protection. I mean, you want better than that? No, I don't want, I don't want supernatural protection. I like being my own person. I like facing this planet on my own. Oh, pardon me, Tarzan, you Jane. You're going to be the weeping Tarzan because it's a jungle out there and there's a lot of things that go bump in the night and there's nothing worse than living in this planet without divine protection and without divine provision. And it's, and it's on the table for anyone who wants this. That's what I don't get. It's a, how can you not want this? How could you not thirst for this and hunger for this and want this in your own life? How could you not take this serious? And it's like, okay. I, I mean, Esther and I talk about it all the time. What can we do? Like, I just shrug my shoulders. What do you want me to do? All I can do is tell them. I'll tell you. I'll point you in the right direction. Can't do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. I mean, is it any sense pressuring a person? Listen, eternal life, supernatural, I mean, divine protection, divine provision. I mean, uh, do I have to pressure you to want that? Or, I mean, what is it that you want? You want, you want pain and suffering, you know, the agony of defeat. What do you enjoy, you know? I don't enjoy any of those things. I like what the Bible says, that we are more than conquerors. I mean, I, I've been defeated my whole life without God. I mean, I'm experiencing now a, a life of, 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 of success, not in my own success, not my own brains. I already tried all that. Not my own strength. All of a sudden, it, that God's strength was made perfect in my weakness. And all of a sudden, I find this tremendous strength in God and this relationship that God has offered. And, and, and a lot of us either reject it, don't understand it, or don't put any effort into it. And, and as I said earlier, you will reap what you sow. You're going to get out of it what you put into it. And that goes for anything you do. I mean, if you enjoy being mediocre, this message is not for you. That's all I can tell you. If you like mediocrity... Not for you. If you like to excel, like I like to excel in things, I mean, you want this, and you gotta put you, you gotta put all your heart into it. Because notice what he says here in verse 30. I and my father are one. I mean, he's talking about spiritual oneness with the Father. He's saying this on the Feast of Dedication. He's saying this is what it's gonna take in order for you to, to, have, to be rededicated to God. Spiritual, spiritual dedication, spiritual oneness with the Father. Because he was saying this as a human being. Yes, I've heard it interpreted that he, he made himself God because that's what they said. You're making yourself God. He wasn't himself, making himself God. He was saying, my Father and I were one. We're, we're, it's, it's like saying, my wife and I, we're one flesh. What, are you going to pick up stones and stone me for this? My father and I, were one. What kind of oneness are you talking about, Lord? I'm talking about spiritual oneness. I'm talking about spiritual dedication. I'm talking about worshiping in spirit and in truth. I'm talking about loving God with all my heart, my mind, my soul, and my strength. Because that's the connection with God. The connection is that we love him, and the disconnection is that we don't love him. The connection between us is the same, that we love each other. That's our connection. We don't love each other, disconnect. 
What happens when we're disconnected from God and we're disconnected from each other? What happens to people that need to be connected? You die. Yea or nay? Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Every branch in me that doesn't abide, is only, it dries out and is good only for firewood. It's useless. It doesn't bear any fruit. In other words, the word love is the connection to God and the connection to each other. And if you're going to be dedicated to God, you must walk in love. If you want to be completely connected to God, you must love Him. And you know what's beautiful about that? Love is our connection to God. Not punishment, not fire, not some cord wrapped around our neck, you know, not some ball and chain around our ankle. And that's our connection to each other. If, you, if I love you, you love me, we're connected. If you tell me I'm a piece of garbage and I tell you you're a piece of garbage, ciao, see you later, we are no longer connected. We're not friends. We're not, you know, we can no longer be connected. When you say ciao, goodbye to God, you're no longer connected. Disconnection from God and from other people is death. Yea or nay? I don't choose to love. Well, enjoy your disconnection. Enjoy your dryness. Enjoy your perishing. I mean, I don't know what else to say it. Enjoy going, being in darkness. But I mean, it's amazing when you think about it. Our connection with God is love. I mean, I mean it's amazing because it says love never fails. In other words, our eternal creator is love. And the Bible says if you don't love, you do not know God. And I don't care what excuse you use not to love, you're not connected. And when you love, what a beautiful connection we have with God that he has with us because we love him because it says he loved us first. Yea or nay? Pray for my hair that's falling out. I have nothing to clip my yami onto. The outer man is perishing. The inner man is being renewed every day. Amen, right? But my connection with God is, is not my physical body. My connection with God is my soul, my spirit. And I've learned to love him. I never loved God before, but he commanded me to love him. Why did he command me to love him? Because he loved me first, he demonstrated his love for me. He laid his life. When I realized he laid you, laid your life down for me. You shed your blood. You took the punishment that I deserved. And now you comfort me like the Bible says. And you love on me. And you forgive me. And you keep loving me even when I mess up. I mean, come on now. I mean, the connection keeps going and going and going. It never fails. We're supposed to be connected to God forever. And we're supposed to be connected to each other forever. Yea or nay? What are people in heaven doing? They're connected to the Father, to God. There's a, there's a continuous and non-ending forever connection with God. As a matter of fact, the Lord described it this way. He said, in the resurrection. Remember that scripture? In the resurrection, you'll be like the angels. And what do the angels do? They always behold the face of my Father. In other words, what are people doing in heaven? They're continuously connected to God. And they continuously love each other. That's the whole Bible. That's what God's trying to teach us. This kind of bond. This kind of oneness this kind of spiritual oneness that we rebel against, that we argue with, that we make excuses, that we don't take serious. I mean, it's amazing. And, 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 and he's telling us to do something that is not a burden. Can you imagine that you're going to say to love God is a burden? To love people is a burden? No, you're better off hating God and hating people and always fighting with everyone. That's so great. I love fighting. I love wars. I love killing people. 
And they could snip this, they could snip this out, of, out of this message and they'll say, this guy's, this guy's a murderer. I mean, there are people out there that hate everything, hate each other. I don't like you. Why? Because I'm black and you're white. You're white and I'm Latino and you're Japanese. I, I hate your guts. I want to cut your neck off. And you speak with an accent. And I don't like the way you look and I don't like your hair. And no te quiero. I don't love you. Get away from me. Bah humbug. And live angry. And live mad all the time. And always looking for a fight. You notice people, there are people out there always looking for a fight? John, you know, I'm ready to fight you. I say, okay. Talk to the hand. I'm a peacemaker. I'm not looking to fight with anybody anymore. That's exhausting. Love edifies. I like to be edified. I like to feel, I like this peace business. I'm not looking to fight with anyone. I was like, it was like a person came in last week. He wanted to fight with me. Where's the rabbi? Here. Can you believe what the Israel's doing to the Palestinians? I said, yeah, they started it. They shouldn't have started. Can you believe the suffering? Yeah. What are you going to do about it? I said, what would you like me to do about it? I'm not Israeli. I'm not in Israel. I'm here. and I'm a peacemaker here. We're here. You want some food to eat? That's what we're doing here. We're loving each other. We love God. We're not in any war over here. I mean, if I could stop the war, yeah, I'd stop it. Of course I would. But what do you want me to do about it? I can't believe it. He wanted to fight with me. Go bang your head against the wall somewhere, you know, to entertain yourself. And he looked like he was like, you know, like he was completely uptight. He's ready, he's ready to fight all the time, and he's an older guy. He's probably younger than me, and I look ten times better than he does. Because he's worn out. He's always in a fight. He's always in a war. He's always battling in his mind. He's fighting with everybody. I had no fight here. I didn't start the war. What do you want me to do? I'm not in Israel. What do you want? What'd you like me to do? Why did I fight? And I'm like, no, I'm having lunch right now. Would you like something to eat? Well, nobody's fighting in here. But I mean, people just looking for trouble all the time. They want to get in arguments. They want to fight with you. Oh, oh, oh to, oh, I'm going to take the Jewish side. You take the Palestinian side. All right. Let... I said, I don't like war. What do you want from my life? I didn't start the thing, and, uh, it, and it's not up to me. You know, if people want to kill each other, you know, if you want to poke the bear, you want to kill 1,200 innocent people, and then you want to run back home and take 200 hostages, I think you just picked a fight. And you're stupid enough to pick a fight with somebody who's going to kick your butt. I mean, that's how stupid you are. I mean, if you're going to fight with somebody, fight with somebody that's smaller than you, not bigger, because you know you're going to lose. Because they came in with 2,000 terrorists and Israel came in with 300,000 troops. <laughs> Stupid though. Oh, we're suffering. You started it. You know, Allah is great. Allah is not that great. You've lost every war with Israel. You've lo every Arab Israeli war you've lost. So Allah is not so great, okay? And you're stupid for picking on somebody who's bigger than you are. Uh, that's, that's my Middle East uh, peace plan. You're a dummy for doing what you did. Now, are they overreacting? Probably. But if somebody messed with you and started and kidnapped your children and killed your family, you might overreact also. You know, you may, you, you may hit back harder. I mean, that's just human nature. You mess with somebody, what are you going to get, you know? You know, you live by the sword, you die by the sword. So, yeah, I feel sorry for those people, but you kind of brought it on yourselves. So, you know, hope it turns out for you. You know, what can I tell you? Hope you end up with your own state somewhere, but I ain't going to be in Israel now, that's for sure. Not after what you just did. That's not, how you, that's not how you went statehood. Now, if you could wipe out Israel, then you can have Israel, but I don't think so. They got a big army now, you know, you know what the Jewish saying is? Never again. We're not going to go to the, the gas chambers. We're not going to lay down. Jews have guns now. So if you're going to mess with Jews, you're going to get hurt. That's all I can tell you. You know, don't mess with the Jewish boys anymore.
They got tanks. They even have nuclear weapons. They don't even tell you how many they got. So, cuidado, piso mojado. <laughs> now, you pick a fight with somebody, you know, careful, you may lose. I mean, just crazy people. But anyway, love is the connection, not fighting, not killing, not murdering, uh, not stealing, all the things that God said that people do that disconnect you from, from life. It actually brings on death because it says the wages of sin is death. When you do the things that God said not to do, you die. You die physically and you die spiritually. And the Bible calls that twice dead. And if you want to live, you're going to do what he says. You're going to love him with all your heart. You're going to reach some kind of spiritual dedication to the Lord. Because, I mean, look what the Lord said. Do you have a few more minutes? Look what the Lord said here in John 4 to the Samaritan woman who, you know, Jewish people aren't supposed to speak to the Samaritan, she said, because we're only partially Jewish. Yeshua said to him in verse 21, John chapter 4, Woman, believe me, the hour has come when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship, you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. If you don't like that, it's your problem. It's not of the Catholic Church. Salvation is not of the Catholics. The Catholics copied the Lord uh, erroneously because they didn't even do a good copy job of him, you know. But anyway, the hour comes and now is, verse 23 was my point, when the true worshipers, verse 23, put that up there. The hour comes and now is when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit. So when Yeshua, in, in, in John chapter 10 and verse 30, when he was saying, Father and I were one, what kind of oneness was he talking about? Spiritual oneness. How do I have spiritual oneness with the Father? That's, that's what we're talking about tonight. Because we talked about spiritual oneness last Friday. Now we're saying, how do you do this spiritual oneness? In spirit and in truth. In other words, the Bible says, walk in the spirit... Walk in oneness with God and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. What does the flesh want to do? Crazy stuff. Flesh wants to conquer. Flesh wants to fight. Flesh wants to kill you. you know. Walk in the spirit. So he's talking about worshiping the Father in spirit. Just worshiping the Father on Shabbat in spirit and truth. Or is he talking about this oneness is an everyday type of oneness? Because the Shabbat is a type and shadow of things to come. I want you to delight yourself in the Lord one day per week on Shabbat. I want you to think about God, Isaiah 58, 13, and 14. I want you to start practicing this oneness on Shabbat because one day I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and you're going to be able to practice this oneness with God on a daily basis. Are you with me? So let, let's practice one day a week. Let's see if you can master one day a week being one with God. And then let's see if you can take it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Because if you can't master something one day per week, guarantee you're not going to do it the other six days. Let's see if you can do it one day a week. Let's see if you can really put your mind on God in a, in a, in a, in a controlled environment around other believers who are not making fun of you and telling you you're an idiot and you're wasting your time. There's no God, stuff like that. You know, let's go do something fun. What do you do? Michigan on Saturday? Are you local? Let's go to the beach. You know, what are you doing at the Michigan on Saturday? Oh, I'm practicing being in the presence of God. What? And I'm trying to be one with God. It's, I mean, you got nothing better to do. Are you crazy? No, I want to be in one with God. I want to be one with God all the time. And, I, and we've got weekly classes being one with God. And I'm around brothers and sisters that don't think I'm crazy. They actually like doing this. They enjoy it. They call Shabbat a delight. They enjoy this oneness with God 
on a weekly basis and they enjoy this oneness with each other. They enjoy this. They, they, there's a place where people enjoy worshiping God and there's a place where people enjoy loving each other and there's a place where, where people are doing the will of the Father here on earth as it is in heaven. And we're practicing this every week and I'm enjoying it. If you told me years ago when I was an atheist that I was going to call the Shabbat a delight, I would have told you, hey, you better go home. You better lay down and, and you better just go away, man. You're talking crazy. But here I am. I delight myself in the Lord. I love Shabbat one day a week. And I like what you, didn't you say Shabbat mode this week? Didn't you mention that? I like walking in this oneness with God in spirit and in truth. I like worshiping God. I am now the temple of the Holy Spirit. I don't have to go to Jerusalem. I don't have to go to a building. I don't have to go to an altar. I don't have to go and bow down to some statue. I don't have to do any of these crazy things anymore. I can worship in spirit and in truth. I can worship in my car. I can worship in my house. I can worship at my desk while I'm working. And no one knows I'm worshiping God. The only one who knows is me and him. Because he's in me and I'm in him and no one else knows. And he that sees in secret shall reward me openly. People will see a true worshiper of God. You will see someone who is being blessed, who's under divine protection, and who's under divine provision. You see somebody who has a peace that surpasses all understanding. You'll see somebody who's light and salt. You'll see somebody who's different, who lives differently, who walks differently, who thinks differently, and they walk in this amazing supernatural power of God. And, all, and, and, and the connection between us and God is one word, love. He loves us, we love him. And we have this supernatural connection with each other because we're all created by God. We're all souls. We're all living souls. We're part of Him. We can't live apart from Him and we cannot live apart from each other. It is not good for man to be alone. When you misbehave in prison, you know what they do to you to punish you? They put you in isolation. You know what it does to somebody to be in isolation? No human contact. In other words, I, we would rather have criminal element contact with other criminals and other crazies that are in prison than to be alone. We cannot survive by ourselves, disconnected from God and disconnected from each other. People say, I don't have any friends. Because you're not friendly. Nobody loves me because you don't love. You know, why don't you do what Jesus did? Love them first. Maybe they'll love you back. Maybe they won't. But hating them certainly ain't, ain't going to work. That's guaranteed no friends, yay or nay. I mean, I got more friends now than, 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 my, than my Rolodex. Why? Because I walk in love for God and I walk in love for people. I love people the way I want to be loved. I treat people the way I would like to be treated. I have lots of friends. I have lots of enemies. But who cares? You can hate me like you hated him without reason. I've never done anything to you. They can hate you and you can be nice to them. Have you experienced that? You love somebody and they hate you? What did I do to you? What's, what, are, what is... Any reason to hate your guts, okay. You know, it's like I was watching, I was watching this program one time and I was talking about this preacher, this, this pastor. And as usual, there was division in the church. It was about a thousand members. And you know how the devil is. He comes to divide and conquer and set one against the other. And all thousand people got into this back and forth and they all left. And the pastor was like, <laughs> the church is dead. Everybody's gone. What am I going to do? He's crying. 
rightly so, right? I mean, if, if everybody on the fight left, nobody's here, I'd be upset. And you know he said what the Holy Spirit told him? Go out and get some more people. There's plenty of people out there. How many people are on this planet? Seven billion? Eight billion we're up to? Oh, my God. So the thousand left, go find another thousand. Amen? In other words, you don't love me, I'll find somebody who's going to love me. Hello, there's plenty of human beings out there. You choose to hate me? Okay, listen, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my existence. <laughs> Let me go find somebody who is happy with my existence. Let me find somebody who's happy with my assistance. Let me find somebody who can understand this, 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 this perception of loving somebody and being kind to them and being friendly. Let me go find some friendlies. There's plenty of haters out there, yay or nay. They hate God. They hate each other. And they're doing so wonderful. Well, how are you doing? You know? Uh, that pretty much describes your life. How are you doing? How are you doing, Gabe? Uh, I'm doing pretty wonderful. I mean, I love God and I love people. That's the Bible. And I've learned to walk in mercy and I will learn to forgive 70 times 7. Yeah, people mess up. Just the way he forgave me, I forgive you because he's always forgiven me. So I walk in mercy now because I've received mercy. I walk in love because I receive love. And I like this love business that keeps me connected to God and that keeps me connected to people. I love this dedication business. I love being dedicated to, to God and I love being dedicated to my brothers and sisters. And you know something? I could do this forever. I think I could do this forever. I think this is good forever. Can you dig this forever? Or you enjoy war and fighting and killing and destruction? You mean this is the way we're going to live with God and with each other for eternity? So we got to put up with some crazies here that don't believe this? For a few years? What do you think, Donna? 70, 80, 90? I don't want to live that long. People are like, oh, I hope you live to 120. Please don't do me any favors. I don't want to live to 120. I mean, I want to, I, I want to live long enough that, I, that I, I, I preach this message. We got it on Facebook. It's recorded. You can watch these messages 100 times if you want. Even after I'm gone, I'll still be here on Facebook. You'll never get rid of me now. It'll be on Facebook. These messages will be on, on there forever. Are you with me? And hopefully I'll see you on the other side. Hopefully you'll make it. You'll stop doing foolish things and acting silly already. You'll get, you'll get the message and you'll wake up one day and you'll say, I really want to be connected to God and I want to be one with the Father the way this amazing person named Jesus did. And I like to have the kind of relationship with people. Did you notice how he was mobbed? How people just loved on him and followed him and just wanted to be with him? I mean, I don't think he was lonely at all. Did you? And he wasn't even married. He didn't have any kids. And he just had all these friends and people that wanted to be around him. They wanted to stick with him. Because when you walk in love, that's like, that's like light and attraction to people. When you walk around angry and mad, and frustrated all the time. Who wants to be around you? That's a, it's like, you know, with a cock of face on you all the time. I mean, who wants to be around people like that? Nobody. So what do you do? I get in the presence of God, and his pre I, I become one with God. I'm in God. What happens when you're in God? And his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Psalm 16, we read this. And I'm in such a good mood, and I, and, and I enjoy being around people, because when you're in a good mood, you want to be around people. And, and, and I enjoy being around people. And I fellowship with everybody here. They're like, what kind of leader are you? You sit there for hours, and people can talk to you? And people can approach you, and you're like hanging out with like the common folk? You're the leader. You should be hiding somewhere. I don't want to hide from anybody. I'm here. I'm here to love God. I'm here to love on you. And I'm here to be an example. I want to be light. 
And I want to be salt and I want to fellowship with you guys. I, w I wish I, I could be one with every single one of you, but I can't be one with you. I can be one with him, but I can love on you and be your friend. And if, and it, you know, if I can help you in any way, I will. And I'll do whatever I can for you, but I am not the Almighty. I'm not all powerful. He is. And I can just lead you to have this amazing relationship with him and live a fulfilled life of connection, dedication, Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Let's stand up and honor him, please. Yeah, your name. Is it that simple? It's your choice. Yeah, your name. Somebody say, yay, I want this. I want this. In Spanish, yo quiero. Yo quiero. I want this. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we praise you. We thank you. Bless your holy name. Father in heaven, thank you for, for showing us your love, that you loved God so loved the world, that greater love has no man than this, that you lay your, your life down for your friends, and we are your friends if we do what you command us. Thank you for the greatest commandment in the Bible, as my friend and brother Tom Jr. said earlier, to love God with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. Thank you for this beautiful instruction, Lord, that gives us this oneness, this connection to the Almighty, to the eternal and loving God who is love. Thank you, Lord, for loving us before we loved you. Thank you for pouring out your Holy Spirit. Thank you for comforting our souls. Thank you for loving us where even no one loved us. And thank you that your love is flowing now through us and touching other people. That as we avoided, that as we shunned, that as we rejected, we now love on other people, even though they're not perfect. Lord, because you took me in, you took us in, when we were not perfect. And you're perfecting us in love. Thank you for perfecting us in oneness with you, Father. And this amazing message that you gave on the Feast of Rededication, Lord. We thank you for these amazing instructions that keep us connected to you, Lord, and that keep us connected to each other. Thank you for this abundant life that you have shown the way, the truth, and the life. And we pray this in the name above every name, the name Yeshua HaMashiach, the world knows him as Jesus the Christ. In his name we pray and the people of God said, Amen, amen. Shabbat shalom. Give the Lord a big hand, please. Thank you for being here. Thank you for watching on the internet. If it's 50 years from now, thank you for watching this. I'll be in heaven. I'll put in a good word for you. And we're going to close in worship and the bedtime shema.
And as we dismiss the service tonight, I just want to encourage you to stay and break bread with one another and share a piece of challah, a cup of chicken soup, and uh, just enjoy fellowship with one another. And uh, we're going to say the bedtime Shema together. I want to thank every single person that donates uh, their time, their efforts, uh, maybe even their finances also, your tithes and your love offerings. Thank you for all of those things. It goes a long way to keeping these doors open. For those of you who don't know, our congregation is entirely supported through volunteer, volunteer efforts. So it's, it's very significant that these doors continue to stay open. It's, it ministers to me, certainly ministers to Rabbi Gabe. We're going to say the bedtime Shema. It's just a, a way to remember to keep our hearts in the right place um, so that when we bring our offering of worship or praise or even our requests, a prayer request to the Lord, that, um, that we will be heard because our hearts are filled with mercy towards others. Remember that Messiah said, blessed are the merciful for they shall obtain mercy. So won't you join me in the bedtime Shema? Sovereign, sovereign of the universe, before I sleep, I forgive all who have angered me, upset, or sinned against my honor, body, work, or all that's mine. Whether willful, careless, accidental, purposeful, or through their speech, by word or by deed in this world or other worlds, let no one be punished for my wrong. May it be your will I not sin again towards you, that I may not do wrong in your sight. May any wrongs I've done be erased in your great mercy, not through any punishment or pain. May the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, be acceptable before you, my Redeemer and my Rock. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, Baruch Shem Kevod, Malchuto Leolam Vaed. Blessed be his name whose glorious kingdom is forever and ever and ever. Good night. We will see you tomorrow morning at 11 a.m. Laila Tov. Shabbat Shalom.